Hey there, Dave Politis, k Missing Project. Got the right edition for our video channel. Thank you for being here. And uh, it's freezing outside. The weather is brutal. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video previous to this that was uh, us on site at Crater of the Moon's National Monument. Had a lot of really good compliments about it, so thank you. Uh, it's unnerving at times to go to these locations and see for yourself how a disappearance unfolds. And I don't know if it's a cover-up or it's lack of intellect, lack of effort on the part of reporters to truthfully say what happened on these cases. I know many times the people writing, writing the article are hundreds of miles away and never make an effort to get there. I get that. But the people that represent the stations that are close by, shame on you for uh, not making an effort to tell the truth. And it, it bugs the heck out of me every time I get into this and I, I see what the truth is. It's, it's really weird. But uh, Montana, northern Montana right now is uh, quickly moving towards winter. I see tomorrow it's supposed to be uh, a little warmer. And then next week we're back into the upper 60s. So hopefully I'll get out there and get a few more fishing days in before winter sets in. Some very, very disheartening news this last weekend. University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. They had to close their campus this last Monday because of a suicide and either an, another suicide or an attempted suicide last weekend. It blows me away. I mean, I've, I've told you guys about this. Let me, let me just read the article. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill canceled classes Monday and Tuesday as campus authorities investigated two possible suicides. University Chancellor made the announcement via email on Sunday, which was also World Mental Health Day, quoting, we are in the middle of a mental health crisis, both on our campus and across our nation. And we are aware that college aged, stu aged students carry an increased risk of suicide. This crisis has directly impacted members of our community, especially with the passing of two students on campus. The announcement adds, after meeting with student and faculty leaders over the weekend, I am announcing a wellness day for our students. This is slowly starting to come forward and it's starting to come out. Just the other night I saw an ad in, on TV talking about mental health and had some athletes voicing their own mental health issues. Trust me, friends. Trust me, this is going to get to be a huge issue in the future. It's not being talked about by our administration, the news, typical, but it's being hidden from you. This is huge. The pandemic COVID issues are killing our young people, not the disease. It's them being aware, away from socializing, wearing masks, uh, not being able to go to school. A friend recently talked to me and he was coaching some young kids. And he was saying, Dave, you don't understand what this, what this has done to junior and senior high schoolers. And I'm talking about the elite level senior and junior high schoolers that are pushing hard and have pushed their whole lives to maybe get a college scholarship. In many of those cases, it's gone. They can't play sports. They can't get in front of scouts. Colleges aren't playing some sports. Colleges aren't recruiting. It's a disaster for some of these kids. A disaster. It's devastating. When you work your whole life for something, you get to the, the verge of being there and then all of a sudden it's ripped out from under you. I can understand. 
and I'm very frustrated about it. I feel for these kids. And as I've told you before, 13 kids since May in the Flathead Valley of Montana have taken their lives. And I know that this is happening at many other locations around the nation and they are afraid to talk about it. They're afraid to open that can of worms and think about if they talk about it, maybe it's going to happen even more. That's the same sort of nonsense about, oh, if you think somebody's suicidal, don't ever talk to them about it. Don't bring it up. Don't ask them. Hey, friends, if you think somebody is suicidal, I can guarantee they've been thinking about it for a long time. And you talking to them about it sure as heck isn't going to push them over the brink. The best thing you can do for them is to talk about it. So I'm going to uh, get into some things. Uh, in the past several weeks, I did a video that included a segment on Cian McLaughlin, 27 years old, who disappeared at uh, Grand Tetons National Park. His parents just came out with another appeal and they described Sion with uh, tattoos on his arms. They described those. They said he was wearing a red Apple watch. He had a red iPhone 12 mini. He was wearing a white t-shirt, necklace, and he had wire rimmed glasses. And uh, the family's struggling right now. They're, they're trying to find their son. This is him. And this is the uh, poster that went out by the family asking for people to be concerned who are concerned and interested and if you're in Grand Teton or you were on the trail about the time he disappeared to please come forward and say if you saw him or if you have any insight as to what, what, what might have happened that day. Uh, obviously the National Park Service doesn't have much insight right now. They can't find him so they need your help. See you in McLaughlin. And I'll try to post that video on the, the description of this one. When you watch this one, you'll be able to scroll down and see my comment as the first pinned comment. And uh, you can see the video we made about him. So another article written in late September of this year says exhausted and anguished. St. Louis University responds to suicide deaths of two students on campus. Undergraduate classes at St. Louis University are canceled Friday after the deaths of two students by suicide this month. There's no indication that the deaths are related. Two student deaths in less than two weeks is overwhelming, Fowler said, the Vice President of Communications. This is a very difficult time for all of our students. We want to be able to do everything we can to not only help them, but support them and move forward. We don't ever want to see anything like this happen again. First death happened on the evening of September 11th in a public area of campus that was visible to people in a dining hall, according to students. On Monday, a 22-year-old man died of suicide inside a residence hall. I only pulled that up because a few universities are going to go public with this. The vast majority are not. When Ben was in graduate school at USC in their film school, uh, he had taken me onto campus and showed me around a bunch of times and one time we're walking around and they had officers come into the film school and talk to the students and they were liaisons for film students getting permits for various things that they wanted to film on campus and around the campus you had to get a permit from the city or from the police and he introduced me to these two officers that he had met earlier and Ben was the kind of guy greatly respected law enforcement. He knew I was, uh, had blue blood running in my veins and he knew what it meant to me and that resonated with him. And so he introduced me to these people and uh, I got to know them. And they were working a special detail. They had special training in mental health and every shift they had a mental health pair working. And the officers told me that in the last year that mental health issues with students in college campuses is just rocking. And they said that almost all universities now have a couple of officers dedicated to nothing but mental health issues, and they're the first ones to respond. 
<clears throat> and, and that's not, and they explain that, hey, we try not to take anybody. We try to talk them down, get them counseling, getting some on-campus assistance, et cetera, and explain the, the various type of assistance that's available and then bring their parents in if they'll allow them. Well, it, it's a relief to me to know that universities and colleges are going to this length to address this issue. The problem, I think, is that kids, young adults, are reluctant to talk to the police about a friend that may be having these issues. Now, if you're a young person and you know somebody's suicidal and you really don't know what to do for them, if you call on camp, if they're especially on a college campus, university campus, and you get a pair of these officers responding, they're going to be super professional, super nice, sensitive. It's a volunteer position, so they took that job for a reason. When I was living in Colorado, I saw a segment on, I think it was called Mountain Law. And the segment dealt with Boulder County. And an, a deputy in Boulder County, and Boulder County includes the city of Boulder in Colorado and the mountain communities around there, and some of them are very rural. And I watched this deputy respond to this mental health suicide type case where this young man, he looked like he was maybe 19 or 20, was threatening to commit suicide. And the deputy was there. And the way that deputy, he's probably 50 years old, talked to that young man was remarkable. There's no counselor in the world that could have done a better job. And I'm not kidding you. And I can remember after that, watching the deputy walk him into a hospital to get counseling. I said, my God, I've never done this, but I'm writing, I'm writing a letter to the deputy. And I wrote a letter to him. About two weeks later, he got back to me. And he, he offered, he said, hey, Dave, if you want to come out and do a ride along with me, it'd be a great conversation to talk to you. And this is way before Ben came out with mental health issues. I just was stunned at how good this deputy was. And he told me this story that he had a son who had mental health issues. And a couple years earlier, his son had taken his life. And he said it changed his life forever. He said he looked at people differently. And I'll never forget the letter. And uh, I don't wish something like what happened to me and what happened to that deputy happened to anybody. I can't think of much worse. But it's to be said that when you go through this, it changes your life. And I don't know what this deputy was like before, but if I was a sheriff or I was a police chief in a city, that man would be at the top of my list for being hired because he was sensitive, caring, showed empathy. I'll never forget it. So there are some great, great police officers out there. It hurts me to hear stories. But just remember something. You can't generalize about people. I don't care if it's about a coffee clerk at Starbucks. I don't care if it's somebody working at Walgreens, Walmart. You can't generalize about them. Oh, they're all this way, they're all that way. Yeah, not true. Anyhow. Back to the letters. Here's this other article from the USO, Military USO. Late September of this year, suicide rates among active duty military members are currently at an all-time high since record-keeping began after 
and have been increasing over the past five years at an alarming steady pace. In 2021, research found that 30,000, 30,177 active duty personnel and veterans who served in the military after 9-11 have died by suicide. Compared to 7,057 members killed in combat in those same 20 years, military suicide rates are four times higher than deaths that have occurred during military operations. I knew this. It bugs the heck out of me. You think about the trillions of dollars we waste on crap and we're not doing enough for our own veterans that risk their lives to protect our country and save us. Bucks the heck out of me. And you know who I really blame on all this? Are the politicians on both sides of the fence. They're both guilty. Show more value in the people right here doing something for us right here before you start doing things for other people in other places. Military veterans out there and you guys in the active service, hey, I'm right there with you. You deserve a whole heck of a lot more than you're getting. All right, moving on. Hey Dave, what being a cop was like 10 years ago is not what it's like being a cop is today. And I just learned that this morning at 2 a.m. that another officer was ambushed, shot and killed here in Georgia. He was 26, had a small child. This was also his first shift with his department. He was merely standing in front of the station at 2 a.m. when a random shooter determined to kill a cop shot him. I'm now in my mid-60s and way too old for this modern BS. I may say a few things here that aren't well received, but I paid the dues allowing me to say them. Police have been transformed into something other than what we were originally meant to be. They are babysitters, night watchmen, revenue enhancement officers via the traffic ticket. But most of all, cops are the modern day boogeyman and scapegoat for all the society ills. If you don't do enough, you are demonized. If you do too much, you're demonized. And if God forbid you do it to the wrong person in the political pecking order. If you are the average criminal investigator, you would never falsify documents to obtain a search warrant. But if our FBI has agents who have done this and gotten away with it, wow. The FBI was once the gold standard for law enforcement professionalism. In a society where ethics and standards have now become so subjective, why the hell would anybody want to be a cop? You can't even crack benign jokes anymore for fear of being disciplined or charged with a crime. After retirement, I tried being a school resource officer, a school cop for a while. When I discovered that I was not allowed to subdue a violent child in the act of harming himself or others, I was shocked. You are required to evacuate the entire classroom other than to stop the violent acts. And under the extreme life and death circumstances where you must subdue a kid, you're only allowed to hold them in a certain way that can bring harm to you, and you can only hold them for seven minutes upon which you must release them. I tried to explain to staff that this would be like stopping one of them for, our, for a DUI and releasing them to go a couple miles down the road and seriously harm or kill somebody in a traffic accident. And of course, Dave, you know whose fault that would be. We live in a day where BLM, Antifa violence has become acceptable, but nobody seems to bat an eye at the death of a cop. I just needed to vent, Dave. Thanks. Bingo. Awesome note. Awesome note. I just read a story that <clears throat> a dad in Virginia had his daughter allegedly molested and worse in a bathroom by somebody and the school district covered it up. And then the, one of the people in the district directly lied to the public and said they didn't know anything about it. What's happening? What in the heck is happening?
I remember being a policeman and the real reason I wanted to do that job was because I knew I had the physical ability and the intellect to make good decisions on the spur of the moment. And many of many people out there can't do it, I understand. And it's something I think that we're wired for. And it could be used for harm, but every time I did something that was for someone, that enhanced their life, I felt great. I can't, I can't explain the feeling. I walked away that night just outstanding. Another letter. Dave, I know you get many letters, so I won't take up too much of your time. I watched today's video where you spoke of someone saying they felt something walking on their bed at night. This happened to me many, many times. It feels like a cat jumping up at my feet. Then it takes a couple of slow steps and then stops and starts walking up to my face. This is the point where I get up and shake my covers. It totally freaks me out. I tell, my, I tell myself that the next time it happens, it won't, I won't stop it, but it scares me too bad. I have to. I went online and Googled feeling of something walking on my bed. And to my amazement, there are a lot of others who have also experienced it. I wanted to share with you these stories. I'm a 70-year-old lady, been divorced for over 20, 20 years. I'm not senile. Do not do drugs or drink alcohol. It actually does happen. I also want to say I'm sorry for your lost Ben. You seem like an excellent father. I pray for you to find peace throughout this. Sorry it happened. It's a parent's worst nightmare. Thank you. Next letter. Hello, my name is Gabriel, and I recently came across your YouTube videos. Was inclined to send you a message on things that I have experienced. This took place in the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas, near rural parts of Alton. I was 17 in 2010, and my neighbor's sister and I were outside in our driveway talking and hanging out. I had noticed a large light in the sky and assumed it was a plane ascending and thought nothing of it. 30 minutes later, I noticed the same light still in the same place in the sky. After bringing it up to everyone else, we watched it for maybe three minutes. Musing on and what I could be and talking about various things, it noticed that we were watching it. I don't know why I think that, but there was a moment where I just felt like it noticed us. The object began to move across the sky, and as it came closer, the size of it was noticeably larger than any airplane. As if that wasn't shocking enough, the object was triangular shaped and made no noise. It was quiet. As it moved closer to our area, it began to move in a zigzag shape to make a crescent maneuver and move south from the east area it had begun moving from, deeper into the Alton rural area. When it was above our neighborhood, I remember feeling a deep dread that would not leave me for days. Following this experience, I would wake up from sleep in that in-between state and would see clear shapes that you have brought up many times. They were see-through, but the outline of them was visible because of how light would bend in those areas. The first time I woke to see them, I thought to myself, oh, it's just them, and I was annoyed. I closed my eyes and was processed what I thought and why I felt the way a fear came over me since the creature seemed familiar in my subconscious. The next few days were filled with these sightings in my home and waking up with scratches. Every day of that week I had an experience. Many would tell me it was sleep paralysis, but the attacks felt spiritual. I decided to recruit two of my friends and we prayed over the, over the house and threw a holy water on each doorway and prayed over it. On one night, I locked my bedroom door, and in my mind, I was trying to lock those creatures out. I woke that night to something opening my door, and I say something because all I remember is big yellow eyes, and I screamed and screamed for it to get out and leave, but I could not hear for myself, although I could feel the strain in my mouth and throat. In the morning, my door was open, open the exact amount the creature in the middle of the night had opened it, and none of my family members said they heard me screaming. After that night, all my experiences stopped and I never saw the creatures or the creature with the yellow eyes. This whole experience began the day I noticed the object in the sky and lasted about a week. Over the years, I've made friends that have seen the same things. Whatever is happening, whatever these creatures are, 
I hope you uncover more information and uncover the truth. It is my belief that these creatures are entities that live on another plane and choose rural areas purposely. My area is a few miles from the Rio Grande River and about an hour from the Gulf of Mexico, so water is there. There's also a salt lake. I don't know if any of this helps your investigations, but I was felt inclined to say it. All the best. I've heard similar things dozens of times. Um, again, I can't read to you everything I people write to me, but dozens of times I've heard these things. So you're not alone. Next letter. We have noticed that whenever you have recently returned from therapy that you're in a weakened or vulnerable state. <laughs> if you only knew. Living in mourning and sorrow during these times is not conducive to good mental or physical health. It would be a good concept to tell your, your therapist to go fly a kite. Really? Analyze the principles behind therapy and you find building a business, keeping your customer, and many lessons of corpor corporatism promoting dependence on your product, and how to addict your customer. Whenever a twinge of sorrow, pain threatens to overtake, reach out for the therapist. No! This routine is not healthy for you and is not good for your wife. I'm not married. Angie needs you not to be in sorrow, but strengthening joy. You have all the power within yourself to be healthy and happy for your own well-being and for your wife. Your son is alive, David. He is an immortal, a god. He will never die. He always lives in spirit. It is not easy to keep this in mind when we are in the physical body and used to the physical world. Your son wants you to be happy and well. He lives in an apartment of divine design. The mansion where he works is a grand palace with a magnificent, magnificent view. Ben has purpose and he is happy. Well, on some counseling issues, I may agree with that person. In my instance, no. The counselor I'm seeing has tried to retire several times in the last couple of years and they haven't been able to because people like me come along and she knows I need her help. She knows that she's helping me. And I, I think that she feels morally obligated to keep working to help. She told me this the other day. She said she was going to try to retire here in the next month or two, but she doesn't know if she can. And she goes, hey, I'm not going to leave you out in the dust. I'm going to keep working with you. And it's those years of insight that this person has that has helped. I mean, the hundreds of people she's talked to in my same position, what she's learned from those meetings, I can't even tell you how valuable that is. So to say that she's there for the money, and again, you can't generalize. I don't believe it. And I appreciate my counselor very much. And there have been times I have been in counseling for other things, and I thought that the counselor was there just to keep the, uh, keep the money flowing. Not here. Sorry. So, I picked out three cases this week. Now, well, there's going to be 10 of you that are going to timestamp this identical period and put it under comments and say, okay, this is where the missing stories start. It doesn't really help me. So, as I've told you before, my channels, this channel is monetized. So, I get some money every minute you watch and it's pennies penny minute quant, a quarter of a penny for every minute it's probably a tenth of a penny for every minute that you watch and every minute that this youtube's rolling so when you have people skip big segments it hurts me especially since i'm not asking anything from you monetarily so you do me well if you watch the segment or put it on in the background and let it play. That helps me a lot. So the first case, when I first heard about it, it reminded me of an incident 
in the Dale Staling case in Mesa Verde National Park. Now, many of you remember it from a segment I did on Vanished for the History Channel. And Dale took off from his relatives and he went through a walk in the park on a trail and disappeared. Uh, the next day there was a large search and rescue. A reporter came out and she didn't even know anyone was missing. The park superintendent tells her to go take a walk while he deals with these issues and come back in a couple hours. So she decided to hike the park. And while this reporter's on this hike, she hears somebody calling for help. And she looked all around, tried to answer him, couldn't find him, ran back miles to park headquarters, completely flustered, told the park ranger and the chief ranger and the park superintendent what she heard. They told her, oh my God, somebody heard that yesterday. We searched it for hours. We couldn't find anybody. We'll send somebody and canine teams again back into the same area and search again. And they found nobody. But this has happened many times, many times. That exact scenario has happened many times. And the people aren't found. And there's massive searches. Inches are covered. So what's happening here? Well, there's a lady named Ellie James, who's 17 years old, August 16th, and 2001. She was from Cornwall in the UK. She was a vegetarian. She was a very sensitive person. She liked people, and she liked getting to know the people in their different ways. She's a really good student. Well, the family decided to take a trip to Borneo. And as a group, her brother, who was 15, she was 17. And they went to the different villages around Mount Kinabalu, which is the tallest mountain in that region at 13,435 feet. And on August 15th, the family had a briefing by the trekking team that was gonna take them up the mountain. There's about 100,000 people a year that take that trail. Not everyone summits because it's a pretty long trip and you have to be in pretty good shape, but there's a pretty good defined trail up that mountain where you don't need any mountaineering skills to get up. Well, they leave early the next morning with the guide tour and Ellie and her brother get ahead of the family and they got very far ahead of the family and they ended up summiting and they hung out on the summit for a while and then they started down well as they started down they passed their family and the rest of the group going up and they said yeah we're going to keep going down and they were on a rope guiding post that was it was in the ground but it was up off the ground you could follow it well right after that the weather changed drastically. Wind, rain, freezing rain, and fog. And somehow or another, Ellie and her brother got separated off the trail and lost. Well, they huddled up for a long time, hours, until finally Ellie told her brother that she was gonna go out and try to find the trail and get help and bring him back. While she was gone, at the end of that first day, the guide from the trekking team found her younger brother, brought him down. Well, Henry, the brother, tried to explain what happened. And the next day, on August 17th, there's a massive search that starts. Massive. And uh, they bring in soldiers, police, fire, and they're searching that mountain. Right away, at about six to 8,000 feet, they're hearing somebody say, help me, help me. Wind's blowing at about 60, 70 miles an hour. There's fog, there's rain, and there's, they're yelling back, yeah, where are you, where are you? And they couldn't figure out where the sound was coming from. This went on for a while. 
Well, they knew the temperatures were getting down below freezing and she wasn't dressed for that type of condition. She was wearing mountaineering type clothing, boots and pants and a coat. But really, you can't be dressed warm enough in those kind of... You need to, you need to get shelter and you need to get a fire. Well, six days after she goes missing, on August 22nd, this is after hundreds of searchers have been on the mountain. They brought canines in. They brought everything in. They couldn't find her. What well, that 6,000 foot level, when they had originally heard her voice, they found a small shelter and tracks that matched her boots. That was, was at 6,000 feet. On the sixth day, soldiers were at 13,100 feet on a very steep slope boulder slope and they found Ellie's body face down deceased and they were stunned they were covering the area for the third time they had searched this area before days earlier and didn't find anything now they find her and they found her in an area where they didn't think she'd be they thought she was down at 6,000 feet where the shelter and her tracks were at and in the area where soldiers had heard her voice. So what do you have here? They bring her body down. She goes for autopsy and it's found that she died of hypothermia. Not surprising. Again, something I have heard many times before and our parents were devastated her brother the last person to see her alive has to live with this but why is this case important well profile points wise you have point of separation as soon as she leaves the presence of her brother something really bad happened. Weather played the major role in this disappearance. Wind, rain, fog. She's found in an area previously searched. And this mountain is made of a material almost identical to granite. Lots of quartz. I won't say exactly what it is, but it's, it's a confusing name to even me. But when I read the description, it's almost the same as granite. And I know a lot of you have to chime in and say what it is. That's great. But case bothered me a lot. And when I first read it and I heard that her voice was heard and they couldn't find her, it immediately reminded me of all the other cases where searchers have heard someone call for help and they couldn't be located. Where are they? Yeah. Where are they? Not an easy answer. Some of you have stated in the past, well, maybe they're in a different portal, in a different plane, in a different dimension. Maybe. I don't know. So the next case involves a young man named Michael Palmer, 15 years old. And he lived in the small city of Wasilla, Alaska. Incident happened June 4th, 1999 at about 4 a.m. He was raised by a family where the mom worked in a hospital, the dad worked on a fishing boat, and the family had three boys. He was described as a really good kid who cared about his family. And the kind of boy that if he was gonna be late, he would call his mom or dad and tell him so. Well, on June 3rd, there was a graduation party. The first time he was ever allowed to go to one. His friends picked him up that night late. They drove over to the party. And at about 3.30 a.m., all the boys decided that they were going to ride their bikes the nine miles from the party back to their home. And they were going to be on a road called the Little Sistina River. 
I get so tied up telling you guys stories. Let me go back. This was Ellie James. The girl disappeared in Borneo. This is the area in the world. This is the mountain where she disappeared on. Over here you got Vietnam, the Philippines, Brunei. So you kind of get an idea where in the world she, she was in. This is a really smart girl. Lost a good soul. So, it's Michael Palmer. Again, 15 years old, from Wasilla. So, he and his friends are on Pittman Road, adjacent to the Little Susitna River, riding the nine miles back to their home from this graduation party. Well, the boys arrived at a location at a 7-Eleven, turned around, and Michael was last in the line of bike riders, and they turned around and didn't see him. So everyone thought that he just went back to the party, so the other boys went home. 11 o'clock the next morning, Michael's mom wakes up. Michael's not home. So she calls the house that had the party, and they said, oh, no, he left 3.30 that morning, yesterday morning. She starts calling around, and the boys said, hey, we thought he went home. She calls the Alaska State Troopers, and they start interviewing kids. And they interview about 20 kids. So they backtrack, and they find a location along that little Susitna River near Pittman Road. And they find the bike that Michael was riding. So they said, okay, he fell in the river. Problem is, this river isn't really big. It's like a creek. And uh, you could cross it. And they said there wasn't a lot of water in it. There were a couple of deep holes. They brought in troopers that searched even the deepest of holes. They didn't find anything. But then you start searching some more, and the search starts to expand. And there's a location where there was a small airport at the time. There's not any more. I'll explain this to you. So this is Pittman Road. This is Wasilla down in here. So his bike is found in on the banks of the creek right here. And over here, there was an old airport. And on the other side of the river, they found his two Converse tennis shoes sitting next to each other, wet with river silt in the shoes. This out here on the other side of the river is miles and miles of rugged, rough forest. Where did he go? Why didn't he just turn around and come back over to Pittman Road because it wasn't that difficult of a walk at all. These are all residences and things in here. There's a street here. As tough as it was to get across, which it wasn't, it would have been just as easy to cross back. But he wasn't there. So, they search more, more, more. They bring in dozens of searchers. They bring in canines. They interviewed about 30 people. Alaska Air, Alaska State Troopers helicopter responds. Massive search. Michael Palmer, 15, never found. What happened? So I was doing the research on this story about eight years ago. And the more I researched that area, the more intrigued I got. And I realized that another person I'd already done a case on, and that case was on an individual named Charles Chucky Palmer, who at the time was 19 years old. So he was four years older than Michael. He was Michael's brother. And Chucky was actually the person in the family who called Michael's dad, who was on a fishing boat at the time, and explained what happened to Michael. Well, at the time, his dad turned around the boat, came back. But on April 10th of 2010, Charles Palmer, uh, he was 30, 
and he had a couple of twins that were 10 years old and another daughter that was nine years old. And he was on a big family event on snowmobiles and they were riding to an area to spend a weekend in a cabin. And it was a getaway for the entire family and special time for mom, I mean for dad and the daughters and granddads. So they took off on the snowmobile near a city called Talkeetna. And they were riding to an area near Bald Mountain where this cabin was located. Well, Charles was last in line on the snowmobile. Sound familiar? Michael was last in line on the bikes. Well, they took off and they noticed that Charles, about halfway to their cabin, made an abrupt turn and started going to the east side of Bald Mountain, away from where they were intending to go. And they thought, oh, maybe he's gonna use the bathroom or something, he'll be, he'll be back. Very veteran snowmobiler who knew his way around the woods, like you know your way around the backyard. Well, eight, nine, 10 o'clock come around, he's still not there. 7 a.m. the next morning, they call Alaska State Troopers and they advise that Charles is missing. So they put a helicopter up. I should note that at the time they were snowmobiling and it had started to snow. At the time that Charles turned, it started to snow heavy. By the time the helicopter got in the air and people from the cabin went out to look, all of the tracks in the snowmobile were covered by snow. So they, have, they went into the area where he turned and they went in on other snowmobiles later and they ended up finding the snowmobile stuck in deep snow. No tracks around it, no Charles anywhere. So the Talkeetna fire chief was in charge of the second and third searches and it snowed really hard for a couple days. They didn't find anything. The fire chief, a guy named Ken Farina made a statement to the press when they asked what happened and he goes, best case scenario, he got abducted by aliens because there's no evidence he went anywhere from that snowmobile, just gone. It's a fire chief saying that. Don't hear that very often. So that's uh, Charles Palmer. 30 years old on April 10th, 2010, about 7 p.m. in Talkeetna on his way to Bald Mountain when he disappeared. I always like maps because maps tell a story. Let's, let's look at this map. So this is Wasilla, Alaska down here. This is the location where Michael disappeared. Houston, Willow, huge rivers, water everywhere, water everywhere. And then it's 40 miles by air to Bald Mountain where Charles disappeared. This is, this is like thousands of bodies of water here, more water here, water everywhere. 40 air miles and two brothers disappear. A very, very strange story. In my books, I've written about several cases, many cases, where people disappear on the same day. It is very, very, very rare to have two people in the same family disappear. In this case, it's almost 11 years difference between the two cases. Can you imagine what Mr. and Mrs. Palmer are thinking. I can't even begin to understand the thought process on that one. Because subsequent to Charles going missing, there were dozens of searches into this area during the summer months thinking they were gonna find a, a body, a skeleton, his snowmobile suit that he was wearing, his boots, everything. He didn't find anything. And any thought 
that Charles was going to dump the snowmobile and walk out of that area in 10 feet or so, ridiculous. You would have died walking out of that area. It was so thick and deep. So Michael's last scene on the verge of a deep wilderness without shoes, Charles found in the thick of a wilderness with no tracks or anything leading out of the area with a fire chief saying, my best guess is he was abducted by aliens. <laughs> Unreal, Unreal. Folks, I can keep telling you these stories forever. I truly hope that there's a breakthrough someday. You guys may laugh about that and say, uh, you know, I really do. And I hope there's an understanding about it. Because it's a scary scenario knowing that on these mundane cases, mundane fun times, that people can disappear and never be found. Now on the Palmer cases, when I first wrote about those years ago, there were a lot of headlines that, yeah, there were actually people writing articles about the story I wrote. Don't be last in line. Pretty much right on point. And there have been other cases where the last person in line vanished. Is there anything to it? I don't know. In Charles' case, you have that point of separation where he abruptly turned off from the rest of the snowmobiles. In Michael's case, he was last in line. Kids went to a 7-Eleven, realized he wasn't there. Point of separation, he's gone too. This isn't the only place here in Alaska where they've had strange disappearances. I've written about many. Now, there are statistics that are bantered around uh, TV shows that are completely garbage. Oh, you know, 200,000 people have disappeared in Alaska in the last 20 years. Bull loney. I was asked to be on a show that just recently aired about Alaska and the mysteries in Alaska. And I could tell right from the beginning that the producers were stretching the truth so far, it was ridiculous. I asked him about it. I said, why are you guys not telling the truth? Those numbers aren't true. Oh yeah, well, you know, our audience needs to hear those things. We, we gotta need ratings. Hey, it's all crap. Which is the reason I won't go on a majority of TV shows. It's because they have the ability to twist the facts, fabricate things that happen in the field, fabricate findings that they find in the field. And it's not worth it to me to participate, but you still see the same talking faces, people that have never done an ounce of research in their life that are on these shows week after week. I feel sorry for you. A lot of you admire these people, and the truth is there's not much to admire about them other than they have had the ability to make a boatload of money at the expense of their own credibility and integrity. So, thanks for being here. I really appreciate your time. Please give me a thumbs up. Please read our books, whether you go to a library and get them and read them, or come to our store, our online store and get them. They're still 75 to $100 a piece on Amazon, a lot of them. $24.99 on our site. Uh, David Politis at Can Am Missing is the Twitter. And canammissing.com is the website for missing people. You can email me at missing411 at yahoo.com. And uh, make sure you are subscribed, please. Other than that, Carry your personal locator beacon if you're out alone. Try not to hike the trails alone. And remember to love your family 
And don't be afraid to give family members and close friends a second chance in life. Thank you.